<laughs> oh, well, there you go then. So, uh, yeah. as you know, Liv, we're going to um, talk about all things music, what music means to yourself, how you got into music, uh, everything that you're doing with music at the moment. But what I like to do with, with all the guests is go back to the very beginning. So where were you originally brought up? Yeah. Um, so I was brought up in Buckinghamshire. Um, like I was born in High Wycombe and then I grew up in Amersham and like Chalfont St. Peter and stuff, like just a very boring, like countryside. Beautiful though. Yeah, Beautiful yeah. area. Um, yeah. People kind of get that wrong. They think it's like just posh rich people, but there's a lot of drugs and just awful shit that goes on there. So yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's good and bad. Okay, and see when you were very, were you into music from when you were very, very young? Yeah, um, well, I was actually like a lot more classically trained than like than now, I guess. I did um, <clears throat> like piano grades, I got up to grade five piano basically, and I was always doing like piano concerts and stuff like that. Um, not very rock and roll at the time, but then I wish that I had actually carried that on yeah. because that would be really useful now to be like an amazing pianist. Yeah. Um, I, I can get by, but yeah. And then, uh, no, I was more into like pop music before I got into like Nirvana and stuff like that. And just, yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to ask before you kind of got into your Nirvana, what sort of songs or what music were you listening to from a young age? Was that just whatever your parents were, were playing in the house? No, mm, no, to be honest, I'm not even going to like be embarrassed about this. I grew up listening to like the Spice Girls and stuff like that. And I think that was like the first thing that I ever bought. And then, uh, so I can't be like, yeah, I'm cool. Like I used to listen to Pink Floyd. But I did, but I, it took me a while to get there. Like until I was a teenager, smoking yeah. weed and everything. And then, but yeah, before that, it was just like pop music. Um, although like, yeah, the first CDs I bought were like Eminem and um, yeah, Green Day, The Offspring, stuff like yeah. that. And then that started to get me more into the Rocky Punk. Yeah, so I suppose it's not a big surprise being brought up in England um, that it was like the big pop band of the time that, that, that you were listening to. But uh, what age were you then when you sort of started to discover your own proper musical taste, like bands like Nirvana and all, all the ones you mentioned there? Um, <clears throat> probably, like, because my brother used to listen to all the time, like, rock, metal, uh, grunge and punk and stuff like that. So I would always hear it from his room, but I, he would get, like, annoyed with me for playing it because he'd think I was copying him. So yeah. I had to, like, keep it in my headphones. But, um, yeah, I would say 11 started listening to 12 maybe i don't know and then um yeah like year seven in school really i would say yeah but just but just kind of going to high school kind of age yeah uh, but the, uh, when we were messaging each other back and forth prior to the, this this call i'd asked you what age you are now i won't reveal to anybody but the reason i'd asked <laughs> that was i was just wanting to know roughly where you kind of felt um and the reason being, you you just said there that you started to kind of buy your, your first sort of albums with your own money. What was the first album you ever bought? Do you remember? Uh, it could have been either. It could have been like Eminem's first album, which I can't even remember the name of. Can you can you remember the name? No, I, I'm not. Same, yeah, or it would have been... Oh, Incubus. Mm. See, I'm a, I'm a millennial, right? So, like, I I don't know. I just, it was either Green Day, um, Incubus, Offspring, Nirvana. That's right. Some, the, the reason I was saying this was I, I got caught out because I, I, was, I had a previous guest on and I wasn't sure what age they were. And uh, I just assumed that she was older than, than she probably was. And when I'd asked yeah. her, question she said to me she'd never bought an album and it blew my mind because I'm over <laughs> I'm probably seven or eight years older than yourself and uh -huh. I'm of the generation where when you were younger you you went to the music shop and when they still had lots of music shops and you would flick through the CDs and you would you know buy whatever it was you're wanting to buy but there is a whole generation where they don't do that now it's and that's just it's just a different way Oh, the things are now, but they, they obviously stream or they go on YouTube or whatever. But it blows my mind that there's there's 
people They've never had a- that are into music that have never bought an album out of shop. It's, I think easy, but it, maybe I'm just showing my age. No, it's the sad, it's the sad thing about the music industry. There's no money, like there's no money really in it anymore because of that reason. So yeah, I think that's sad. It's it, you know, it's got its ups and downs in terms of like you, you, the exposure you can get nowadays on the internet, obviously, is a lot more than what you would just you, you know, the chances you have to make it now are. I mean, again, that's got its pros and cons, but yeah, absolutely. Like I miss CDs and all that. It was exciting. And then, yeah, I had a slightly strange musical journey, but I'll let you ask the questions. I mean, it was that thing as well, and you would probably agree with us that when we were younger, because you didn't have this unlimited supply of music that, that you've got nowadays, you would maybe only have, unless you were stealing them from your brother, you would maybe only have 10 albums in your room. Yeah. So mm-hmm. you, you would know the albums inside out because you would it would just be those same 10 albums that you would listen to on loop you would know the track listing you would know that you know you would read all the the inside sleeve the booklet that came with it and you know it was a whole package you know artwork was just as important as the the words inside the booklet as the track order you know yeah. kind of lost nowadays i think because you just stream it and don't get me wrong, I'm as guilty as the next person that, you know, it is easy. It's great in some ways to just go, I love that song, you download it and you've got it straight away. But I don't know, there's something nice about the old days of uh, being able yeah. to, if it was a package, it was, it was yours to hold in your hand and say, this is mine. Yeah. Like it even just reminds me of that Blink-182 album with the really hot girl, yeah. Uh, you, yeah. See those sorts of things. I mean, Pink Floyd. The 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 um, artwork's always gonna. That's always gonna be in your mind for start, uh, You know. But yeah, for things like that, Nirvana. Well, Nirvana. I can remember all their artwork. And now you're right. Like I, yeah, Spotify and things like that. I have no idea what any of the artwork is. Nothing. I mean, and it's yeah. It's still important, I think. And uh, and I've asked people, especially the especially the the ones that stream a lot of their music you know it is artwork still important and they most of them say that it is because you've still got to stand out even if you're mm. on Spotify if you've got a, a cool album cover it might just catch your eye and make you play that song but nobody's got any attention span now like you'll give something 30 seconds and then you move on to the next thing and yeah. Apparently it's seven seconds now, the attention span. It's gone down to that. I'm doing some content and stuff like that right now and affiliate marketing and other stuff. And I'm like, God, you literally have seven seconds and you have to put all this crazy shit and like, yeah, and to make any <clears throat> them last more longer than seven seconds. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy when you, you just mentioned Pink Floyd there. If they were a band coming out nowadays based on that formula, they wouldn't make it because, you know... Let, let's say it was 10 seconds. The songs don't get going until maybe a minute or so into it. You know, there's, like I like the rock stuff and someone had reviewed the the, the most recent Metallica album. I think it's a couple, mm. a couple of years older now. And then one of the things they came up with is that the, the singing doesn't start until at least two minutes into most songs. Mm-hmm. Most songs are finished by that point. Yeah, you're right, actually. But then I just think if, you know, if someone listening to Comfortably Numb or something the whole way through, then you can't, you would, that would still be shared a billion, zillion, zillion, zillion times. Although it does annoy me. I'm not, like, saying he's bad or anything. I just, it's not my thing. But Justin Bieber has more views than Pink Floyd and stuff like that these days and probably Queen. And I'm just like, well, you know, I, I just I just wish, yeah, that's showing my age as well. But I wish that... Um, I don't know. I don't like how the music industry has gone particularly. Like, yeah, I still listen to all the stuff I listen to. I was also because I've got ADHD as well. And I just, it's the dopamine thing of knowing the song and listening to a million times. I do listen to new music, but not like, you know, I wouldn't be able to tell you many names of new artists really right now. It's funny because uh, I, I play gigs in the pubs, you know, I just, mm. play, just play guitar and singing. And one of the things that we've discussed lots of times before is, and I don't know if you do covers as well or, you know, for fun even, but when you're playing in the pubs now, if um, 
if there's a new band that comes out with a new song and it, it's the big song at, at, at the moment, if you start playing it and the public goes down great, see after maybe a year, you need to get rid of it because it's got a shelf life. It, it sounds tired uh, very mm. quickly. Whereas if you go and play a song by the Beatles or Creedence Clearwater Revival, you know, something yeah. that's 40 or 50 years old, it still sounds just as good today as it did back then. And, and part of that will be a bit, a bit of nostalgia, but there is mm-hmm. something that's missing from today's music. Well, I think it's the amount of, it's, it's the production. It's the amount of p- p- compression. They have to compress everything into this box of like wall of sound. And there's no dynamics really in the music. It, like I've had, uh, I have to be careful what I say here. So some production that I have <clears throat> done, like, or collaborations. Oh, okay. How do I, I'll put it another way is I would like that dynamic back of where it doesn't matter about the exact mix down and master and, you know, the warmth comes out and all the bass lines and everything. And it, it can be messy where, right? cause radio will just go now that I had one track that I produced is drum and bass track, pretty different. And they were like, yeah, if you fatten up the kick drum, we'll play it on kiss FM. And I was just like, well, it sounds fine as it is, you know? And it's so like, they've said that. It's so like, anyway, so yeah. It's interesting because someone had said to us before, and I'd never thought of it like this, that they liked pop music, but they said not pop music of today wasn't their thing. Pop music from, from years ago, but they said pop music from years ago is different from pop music today, as in pop music from the 80s back to be, it was actual bands. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's bad of creating music, and you know there's nothing wrong with like your Justin Bieber and all that. That you know, there's people that like that sort of music. It's fair enough. It's making somebody a lot of money as well, mm-hmm. from a business <laughs> point of view. But it's almost like the music today. Some people will argue that because technology is so good, you can make everything so perfect it, it loses the feel. Yeah. You know? Someone, someone else had said to me that they'd went on a course and it was for creating music, like a songwriting course. And they'd said, you know, back then you obviously had pop bands that would go into the studio, they would write music, they would play it and it would be a big hit. That's great. They're saying nowadays you go in and it's got to be four minutes, 20 seconds long. They already know what key it's going to be in before you even start writing the song. You know, it's yeah. got- have this, that, the next thing, and it loses all the feel because it's already oh, yeah. even started to write the song. Yeah, completely takes the creative process out of it. I, um, like, used to, for instance, go when I was DJing, I would go into record shops and buy vinyl, um, and I would sit there for hours listening to all the vinyl. I wouldn't care what key it was when I was mixing it and they would still be banging mixes. And then like, I then switched to some soft DJ software and started using mixed in key. And then I honestly lost all my creativity after that. I was like, okay, this needs to go with this. And And then my mixes honestly became quite boring. Whereas before they were like, I would just say I took more risks with them and stuff. And then, yeah, in the studio producing, drum and bass, uh, there was all these, like, yeah, just putting everything into box of rules, just so many rules that you just lose, and then you start getting anxious, and then, so, yeah, nowadays, I just write, yeah, whatever. Sometimes if it's, it's cool, sometimes it's cool to just remember just to write for yourself, and if someone loves it, brilliant, but if they don't love it, then that's fine as well, but stop trying to write for somebody else. Just play what you think is good. And usually that nine times out of ten, that's actually the best way it works. Oh, completely, yeah. I've, uh, <clears throat> no, I wrote my best music after, like, death or, yeah, just, like, toxic relationship, drugs. I don't know if what I'm allowed to talk about on here, but, like, <laughs> just uh, horrible experiences. I just write the best music and, and no one's telling me, yeah, yeah, what to write about it. So someone said, write a happy track. I was like, I can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> it's not my forte. <laughs> so we've obviously went on a big detour there, but you're getting into to your own style of music, uh, your own influences when you're, a, like, say, a teenager kind of time. Is it just vocals that you do or do you play any instruments? 
No, like I said, I play piano just enough to get by to say, I, you know, play some chords, yeah, yeah. sing over, blah, blah. Then I'll get a good pianist to actually go in on it. But I'll write, write I'll write the lyrics first usually, or I'll. But then I'll go into a studio like in London. I've worked with Itai Kashi. Kashi, I always get his name, but he's brilliant. He's really good. I've worked with him so many times. Like, still should be able to pronounce his name. Great. Um, and then. In North America, I've done lots of studio sessions with lots of people, Dan Flynn being one of them. Um, yeah, so we will either just create a vibe in the studio or I'll bring a song <clears throat> with a melody and the lyrics I've already written and then they'll do the music so over the top. How did you get into singing then? Like, did you go to lessons or how, how did that come about? It's so random. Like, literally, I don't would not consider myself a singer at all. Like I have, a, I know I have a good tone and I know I can write songs, but I'm not a singer, but like I enjoy performing them because I know the, what I've written and the feeling and all that. But um, I basically, long story short, I, um, when my brother died, which was December, 2019, <clears throat> and I quit DJing cause that was a horrendously just, Soul destroying after a while that like I I no not many people would say that but it really just became boring. I was like, I'm not really doing what I can't progress here. So and then uh, my brother died and was and he was really musical, much more than me. He was amazing. Like he could have, you know, without can I talk about drugs and stuff or yeah. yeah. No. He was like a heroin addict and he died unfortunately as a result of that. Um, but he would have been like Kurt Cobain and I'm not, not just saying that cause I'm his sister. Like he was just an amazing talent anyway. So then he died and then I've just, I could have either gone on a massive bender of drugs and gone the same way or I, I just, so I channeled it into music and I just found that I could write songs like yeah. rock songs and stuff like that, acoustic, whatever. And then I got all of my not all, obviously, like, but my grief and emotion out into the. I wrote a whole album, and not I didn't release all those songs, but it was so it just was yeah cathartic, therapeutic, and all that stuff. And then I feel like I channeled some of his um, musical ability as well. And then I just sort of singing and singing and singing and singing and just daily, daily, daily. I didn't get any lessons or anything. I'm sure you'd be able to hear that if you heard me live. But <laughs> but um, yeah, it just kind of naturally it- progressed. It's amazing what you're saying, like, obviously music helped you, you know, obviously through that bad time. Was, sadly, my dad passed away just in December last year, so only six months ago. And time in 30-something years, I just could not be bothered with music. I got fed up playing. And, you know, I've, I've, had, I've not done many gigs this year um, and just kind of lost the sort of... Um, the, the spark to kind of write, but within the last month, you know, something's just changed that I've got back into it and I'm, you know, really enjoying it again. And it's one of those things that helps sort of bring you, to, uh, mm-hmm. you know, whatever it is you're feeling. It's, it's one of the great things about music. It's incredible. Yeah. It's interesting how it affects everybody d- uh, differently, death and like, but you've got back into it now. Yeah. 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 That's cool. Yeah. I'm so sorry, I have a cough. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Just cough it out and then yeah. everybody is ill in New Jersey and New York. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Lots of recording, yeah. lots of uh, starting to do gigs again, uh, lots of uh, writing as well. So it's interesting, but it's different for everyone. But for yourself, you kind of touched on it there, but how do you go about writing a, a new song? So do you start with the lyrics, did you say? Yeah, start with the lyrics, hum melodies and stuff like that. There was actually, <clears throat> I knew this would happen. I was like, you're going to start copying and not be able to stop. Um, yeah, and then I, uh, Itai, who I was working in some studios in Soho before on drum and bass, completely other stuff, like uh, beforehand, where we'd work with Kimberly Wyatt for the Pussycat Dolls and everything. It was going really well. And then I, anyway, long story. I'm sorry. You can, you can probably really see the ADHD coming up, but yeah. And then Ite was working with Guy in the studio, but then me and Ite uh, found each other and we would became almost writing partners, but I would always write the top lines and the lyrics. And then he would play the guitar 
or you know, I would, I would play some keys or whatever. But most of the time, he would come up with the music, and I would just come up with the top lines and the, the melodies and the lyrics. And um, yeah, uh, are your lyrics like if I was to sit and read a, a song of yours, would I know exactly what you're talking about? Or you know, sometimes lyrics can be quite vague. Or if you if you ask ten people to read them, ten people would have a different idea of what the song was about but sometimes you get lyrics that are spot on I know exactly what you're talking about most mm-hmm. of them, do they fall under that they're quite you know what you're talking about it's a very good question actually um yeah no uh like if you imagine I don't know my mum told me once that Kate Bush wrote about like curtains hanging up and stuff and you would have no idea anyway but um, yeah no I think that I think my lyrics are really obvious but I've heard that they're not so Like, I think they're obvious if you want to, like, one, I wrote about my ex who, (laughs) I've had a great run of death in the last five years. He uh, killed himself. And um, so I wrote, but this was while he was alive. We had a a bad relationship argument and I wrote, never had a soul. And it was really like tongue in in cheek, but like, it's it's me going, I never had a soul. Like, it's, it's me. It sounds like I'm saying I never had a soul. Like, I'm being really bitchy, blah, blah, blah. But it's actually more uh, was my view of him at the time. So it was a complete like opposite lyrics. And then like rock, paper, scissors, I wrote that about. So rock, rock, paper, scissors about like drugs. But I don't think you'd have any ideas about drugs. Um, And that was about playing games with your life, like a star in the bottom of the glassy life, shoot and full throttle all through the night. You'll take me down. I'll take you down. It's quite vague. I don't know. I don't know. It's a good question. Like, I think that they're not... not necessarily really obvious except I'm trying to think of one that is obvious like my new one coming out poison I don't think that's obvious that's about heroin um and a a narcissistic ex that I had who when Alex my brother had died he like basically fed me that and I I should not be saying this on camera but um and I was only the first time I died last time and um yeah, so I was like, smoke your killer bee, smile as you feed me, your pinprick eyes, shallow breathing, handsome face, it's receding, the devil's calling me. Would you think that was about heroin? I mean, it's a, it's a weird one because it, it could be, it depends who you're asking. Like, I, I remember, um, you know, the band Pearl Jam? Mm, yeah. So Eddie Vedder, the, the singer, the, the big song from their first album was Alive, you know, and he wrote it about one thing but then he's saying that over the last 30 years the meaning of the lyrics have changed it's the same lyrics from 30 years ago that he's singing Mm -hmm. for him the meaning of it has changed over time you know and then you get people like um, you know the band Oasis Mm -hmm. Uh, you know they'll write a song and, and Noel Gallagher who wrote the songs would say someone would say what does this song mean and he'll say, I've got absolutely no idea. He yeah. Says, but he says, I don't need to know what it means because when I play it on stage and 20,000 people sing it back to me, it means something to those 20,000 people. I don't know what it means. It's not my job to know what it means. It's my job to play it for those people. Yeah. But then you've got like Metallica, the big song Master of Puppets. Now, I think mm. about that was about um, drug addiction and how you can take over your life. Mm-hmm. But I've heard other people go, oh, I, th- I thought it was about alcohol. Somebody else thought it was about a bad relationship. You know, it, it's yeah. a, how lyrics are different for everybody. And that that's the nice thing about it. I think Dave Grohl said something about that the other day, is it's up to them how they, they how it's up to the audience how they want to interpret it. And that's the beauty of music. It's, it speaks to everyone differently if it's written well or whatever. And I like that the thought of people listening to it and I would love to know what people would absorb it uh, of like my own stuff. I mean, Dirty Diamond, I think is pretty, like it's not obvious as, well, maybe it's obvious about my brother. I don't know. You got me thinking about that anyway. Yeah. Good. That's, That's a good question. You, you had um, Jim Morrison from The Doors. So he uh-huh. was the majority of the lyrics. And when anyone asked him what they meant, he didn't like to explain what he thought they meant. Because then he was like, now you think what I'm thinking, but it's I want you to come up with your own thing for it. And so yeah. it's different. It's different for everyone. But when you're in the studio 
Uh, so you're saying that you write the lyrics, you come up with like a vocal melody. Mm-hmm. What about recording in the studio? So do you record live or do you do you layer it? So do you maybe do the drums first and put the bass, the guitars, do the vocals last? Like, have you got a preferred method from how you record? Uh, no, not really. How, whatever comes naturally, like... Uh... Never drums, I don't think. Drums never come first. I think drums always come last for me, actually. Uh, it's usually getting the either piano and the guitar with the vocals down and then everything else after that. And the, uh, but I always like to be helping with the arrangement and stuff, like, because, uh, yeah. But no, what about you? What's your process? Well, it's funny you say that because I was doing some music today and uh, it's uh, start, starting the recording process. And it's the drum tracks I'm doing first. So for, for me, it's get the drums down and then get the bass player in get the, to get the bass, to get the foundation of the song. But it depends. I'm doing rock music. It's, mm-hmm. it's depending maybe what style you're doing as well. Yeah. Uh, speaking with someone that was on the podcast previously and they do kind of blues country music. So they, they'll sit in the studio live and they'll record the guitar and vocals completely live and then, mm. then they'll get everybody else in to record on top of it. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, no, I do that live and then, yeah, everything else comes after, absolutely. But, yeah, I'd love to do what you said and try just over, uh, just a drum track first and then get, like, a get a vibe that way. I've tried, yeah, I've never done that, so that would be a good uh, idea. I'm living with a drummer, so... Perfect time. <laughs> You've not got any excuses then. No, exactly. <laughs> so when you're um, performing, when you're doing, when you're doing gigs, do you have a, a routine? What's your warm up? Being being a vocalist. So I'm very new to it. It might not look like by my Instagram. It might not look it. I'm not new to music. Like I've gigged to thousands of people, but always either. This sounds ridiculous, but. And when I say rapping, I wasn't like rapping like uh, that girl from Cash Outside or whatever. Actually, she's pretty good, annoyingly. Um, but no, it would be more like spoken word stuff over the drum and bass live. <clears throat> and then I would have live singers and stuff like that. So the, the, the very few experiences I've had with gigs with rock, like nervous is just horrible there's no warm-up nothing i would just get drunk actually which i've stopped doing that now because it doesn't help anything but apart from makes you a bit no i need way more gigging experience and stuff i've just got just today funnily enough a new basically i had a manager called raymond mcglamory and he was a uh, brilliant like he signed um i want to get this right uh that lots of big bands if you yeah, and he was Warner Brothers, like the VP of Warner Brothers for a stint and everything. And uh, But he passed away as well. And that was when I just went, like, and I wrote him a song, which I'm going to release soon, called Fighter, which is very obvious. That song very obviously about that. But, um, so after that, I was like, God, how much more can I take or am I cursed? So, But now today, I've just uh, been speaking to a new manager, and he said, do you want me to manage you? And he... Um, he works for Total Artist Management, I think that's the dot com, and they're really big, so I'm really excited. So that's the next thing is, and but thankfully I've done everything kind of. I don't know if it's backwards, but I've got a whole load of like two albums or three albums worth of music, and so that's ready to go. So now I just need to, yeah, like because like I said, the performing experience has come from all the DJing and the gigs and the rapping and the this and the that, but. Yeah. This is different. <laughs> like I can't. I have no memory at all, and so le- like a lot of time, all I was just thinking the whole time was I'm going to forget all my lyrics, and yeah, it was horrible. Just all the because I'm my songs are really wordy, which I'm yeah. So I'm just gonna my process in the future will be do a vocal warm up and stop being an idiot about it, um, and don't drink. Because that's loads of acid. And just, yeah, just uh, try and relax and have fun with it. And that's why I don't like doing covers either, because I'll forget. Apart from Outside, I did a cover of Outside 
Stained endorsed it, which was really, really nice. I was surprised by that. And that went on national radio with L.A. Lloyd's Rock Show, um, which, again, big surprise. That was the first song I'd ever released of my singing, and I didn't expect it to go anywhere. And then it got, like, hundreds of thousands of whatever plays and stuff. And um, I wish I'd brushed my hair for the video. <laughs> I didn't even look, like, remotely good. And I, I don't now. I'm wearing, like, jogging bottoms. But, yeah, it was crazy. So I just need to get back into gigging, I guess, and, yeah, all of that jazz. See, having done both, so having wrote songs and, and recording them in the studio and then performing live, if you had to pick just one to do, which one would you, would you do? Honestly, like, I don't want to be famous uh, these days. I think I would have back in the day of, like, Queen, you know, Pink Floyd, da 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 But, um... Nowadays, it's horrible. Like, but so I would pick a uh, good, quite good question again. You're a really good um, interviewer. So, uh, yeah, I would pick studio and writing songs over. Like, I love the idea of touring to, to thousands of people. Actually, when they become a sea of faces, it's a lot easier than intimate gigs. That's for sure. I know from doing radio and stuff myself, it's so nerve wracking. Um, but. Yeah, what was the question again? I lost my train of thought. Yeah, if you had to pick just writing and recording or performing for the rest of your, your days, which one would you pick? Yeah, so nowadays, because of, yeah, social media, the internet, blah, 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 I think it would be horrible. Like, you know, the sound bites, everything's taken out of context. AI makes shit. Like, what I mean, it. you can't, like, every uh, interview I've seen with celebrities, they just... I mean, they're not happy, and then everyone gives them so much shit. There's like, you just, you've got to have a really, really, really strong backbone to actually that nowadays to be able to do it. What do you think? As much as uh, as, as I like performing, I think there's something in me. If, if I've got four or five songs, I need to write and record them. Now I might, I might write and record them, and once they're recorded, I might never listen to them. Again, right. I'm very rarely will I go back and listen to them, but it's almost like you need to kind of get them out of your head mm-hmm. and, and then get them saved somewhere. I think that would drive me up the wall if I could never do that again. So I think I would probably pick that. Uh, I mean, from a, a business point of view, it would it would be brilliant if someone would pay you that, that you could obviously live off it, that you could just write and record all day long. That, that would be great. Um, I don't know. The performing is cool as well, but I, I think if I had to pick it, probably be the, the writing and recording for myself. Yeah, that's when I am, because I can't relax ever. But that's when I, the, the only time in my whole life I'm in the zone or whatever is then. And I, 12 hours can go by and I'll be like, yeah, I'm ecstatic. Whereas, you know, with you've got just the whole two weeks of fear of a big gig coming up to it and all the stress and the cortisol levels and everything just goes up. And then, you know, there's all that, oh, am I going to fall off the wagon? And it's just such an unhealthy, you know, if you're not, yeah, again, really strong uh, minded or not an addict, it's, it's difficult. It really is difficult. It's like, funny you said there as well, that uh, playing to playing to a sea of faces the many people as well that I've spoke to, and if they say if they play to two hundred people, that's fine. The minute they see someone in the audience, like a family member or somebody they know, it it makes the whole experience that much worse for some weird reason because they're they're obviously there to support you to cheer you on, but yeah, they would rather play to two hundred strangers than to ten people that they know. Oh, God, completely. Oh, my God, I know. At one of my gigs, um, I love my mum, but she came and was filming the whole time, and I was just watching her, and I was like, I'm going to forget all my lyrics. I'm going to forget. And my best friends were there as well, and I was looking at them. And I, was just, I remember watching London Grammar. Uh, do you know London Grammar? No. Okay, beautiful, angelic voice she is. They're kind of psychedelic almost. I don't know what they are, but anyway. And she... And this was at Glastonbury and um, she was in the middle of this like just insane like you could hear a pin drop it was just absolutely stunning and then she saw one of her best friends and she started laughing 
into the microphone and was just like, I'm so sorry, guys. I can see one of my best friends and they're distracting me. And I was like, oh, I feel your pain. That is awful. And then she couldn't concentrate. And I was, but she still smashed it. But yeah, it was just like laughing in the middle of this like outstanding performance of just, yeah, yeah. it's funny. I've, I've got that problem now that my daughter's 18. So she, she came along to, cause of, it's a, you're in places serving alcohol, you've got, got to be 18 or over. And she mm-hmm. came along to the first gig. And it was horrible because I spent the whole time, like, being a protective parent, like, nobody better, no drunk person better speak to her. And it just totally threw my gig off. So I was like, oh. well, like I don't know. <laughs> just, That's so cute. Yeah, feeling old. But we've obviously been quite technical uh, live up to this point, talking about all different bits of music. So we're going to end things on some fun questions for you. We'll uh, brighten the mood, right? So <laughs> imagine you go back in time, anywhere in the world. What's the one concert that you wish that you could have attended and witnessed? I mean, so many, but when I see, and this is just going to sound so cliche, but it's just, they're the greats. So, um, Live Aid, Queen, <laughs> that. It's, it's the most popular answer so far. Uh, that yeah. And- that and what? Woodstock. Yeah, I was going to say that as well. Because, but, I mean, they're the most popular answer because they were phenomenal. Like, can you imagine the freedom and the vibe and the no phones and the just because like I, I just yeah I mean their looks electric like there's n- I mean I've been to some amazing gigs and mostly at Glastonbury like incredible stuff that was just random that I probably wouldn't have bought tickets for like I saw Lionel Richie um incredible and I was high as a kite and I basically um and he was like and it was raining and he he goes I brought the California sunshine. I was like, no, you didn't. It was a completely like black clouds and rain. And then literally, I, w- I'm, I wasn't tripping. This actually happened. The clouds just parted and like a beam of light shone on his head. And he was like, hello. And I was like, oh, my God, that was pretty. I started crying. That was amazing. But um, no, I would go back to that that live aid gig. I would. How about you? It's amazing when you watch it. I don't know for myself. I mean, there is those gigs that would be really cool to see. I, I still, there's part of me thinks it'd be really cool to see a lot of the older bands just before they became big. So, mm. be like seeing the Doors when they were playing the whiskey before they got signed for the first album, or seeing, <laughs> uh, or maybe Pink Floyd with Sid Barrett back in London back in the the sixties. Elton John as well, the whiskey. Yeah. yeah. The bands like Pearl Jam, see, like when the first album came out, when they were 24, 25 years old and they were just on fire for the first two, three years, they were unstoppable. You know, mm-hmm. and then bands like In Excess, when they played Wembley, that was absolutely outstanding. And I don't know, there's, there's so many. The big, big gigs are really cool, but I think some of the really small gigs would have been really interesting to. Yeah. Just, Definitely. I mean, I think I I still prefer like be. I don't know. I I thinking about it. The ones I've been to, the ones I've enjoyed the most recently were like Red Hot Chili Peppers. I, I can't remember which football stadium because I was out of my head. But Muse live at the Emirates or wherever it was, and they were the huge stadium. You know, where it's just. Yeah. But yeah, I can't. I don't really think of a any super intimate gigs I've had with my favourite artists. I can't really, yeah. So I've always enjoyed the big stadium electric, like yeah. thousands. I, mean, I seen Foo Fighters two weeks ago in, in Glasgow, and that was like 50,000. And, and yeah. it does, doesn't happen very often in Scotland, but it was actually a really nice evening. You know, the sun was shining. Even Dave Grohl was shocked. He was expecting it just to be rain because it was Scotland. But, um, and as much as it was good, though, I, I think I still prefer the gigs. And there's a lot of places in Glasgow that, that hold about maybe 2,000 people at the most. Mm-hmm. They're relatively small, I suppose, in that scale. But it doesn't matter where you are. You get a good view and it's good to see them. And it's indoors. It's a little bit more um, controlled because it's not mm-hmm. out that. But uh, I don't know. There, there's so many. You could go on forever and pick bands and different yeah. types of it would be I'm, cool. 
I wish I could remember the name now uh, of a metal band. My my old manager was uh, their tour manager, and I saw them randomly. Oh, God, uh, it's so frustrating because I can't remember their name. They were like this ridiculous, demonic, heavy uh, metal, like massive band. Like, and then I saw them in Brixton at a quite a small, well, a smaller venue anyway. And I had the best night of my life. So, yeah, I know what you mean. It was like, and I wasn't expecting to enjoy every single track, but they had the most, oh, the craziest fire and all this like demonic shit. And it just looked amazing. And everyone in the crowd, even though and people get that wrong, they think like metalheads are just these awful. And when you get there, the nicest people in the world, whereas at house music festivals, they're a bunch of dickheads. <laughs> yeah, I love you. Know? <laughs> right. Another question then for you. Uh, along the sort of a similar vein to that, there's millions and millions of amazing, great songs that have been recorded over the years. What's the one that you wish you could have been in the recording studio to, to see the band actually record it? <clears throat> That's so difficult. It would have to be one of Pink Floyd because they're my favourite band. Um... What, what Pink Floyd, though? Would it have been Sid Barrett, Pink Floyd? Dark Side of the Moon, like, I... Oh. Wish you were here, would have been quite cool to... Yeah. Um, see, again, it's so cliche, but that's my favourite song ever, has been comfortably numb, so I can't even... Yeah. Like, that, that song is just one that I can listen to again and again and again and again and again and not ever... And still feel that incredible emotion and still shocked by it. Like every single, I think that's the best song ever written in the entire world. Like unbeatable. And every time I do this, I, I sit people down and we play a bunch of amazing tracks and live performances and everything. I always play that one and no one can ever beat it. You, you, you know, they put on Led Zeppelin, Stairway to Heaven, blah, 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 afterwards and Queen, blah, 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 whatever. But I just can't. For me, that's like the end credits to life. Is this that last? Like, that's what I would play if I was about to die, for sure. Like, what would you? I, I would love to. I mean, there's great songs like Bohemian Rhapsody, but I don't think they would have been as interesting to actually watch because it's so pieced together. It mm. would, I, I think I would have went back. Like, one of my favourite bands is The Doors. Mm -hmm. And what I like about the really old bands like that was... Their, their last album, Ellie Woman. So the song, the song Ellie Woman, um, the, the the band wrote it, but because they recorded it in 1970, 1971, it's the band playing live in the studio. So they're, they're all mic'd up, and what you hear is them. It's a, a real band actually playing, and like the, Jim Morrison, the singer, he he's sit, he's sitting. Toilet of they recorded it in the rehearsal place, and he's in the bathroom because you get natural reverb in the bathroom. So that's how he's recording the vocals, and I just wow. think like, that would have been amazing to to watch. But that's that's similar to Pink Floyd, you know, like a yeah. that's you know they're connecting with each other and, and playing to create well, the beautiful music. Yeah. Yeah, I think the reason I love Pink Floyd so much is because it sounds like every single song. Yeah, similar to the door. I guess it's it's just like a, a jam that they've just they start they press record they jam that out. There was no thought press. You know, it just sounds like they they were. You know what I mean? Whereas nowadays everything's so contrived and like yeah, that's what like, why. What what was always cool about Pink Floyd though was, you know, they didn't have they didn't have to be like this technical guitar solo to show off the way no. they, the way they play the guitar has got such feeling in it. And it, it fits the song. It, it makes the song better. It's yeah. Not, not there to make the guitarist, you know, everybody look at me, I'm in the spotlight. It, the, what he's playing, it might just be bending one note, but it, I know. it, it makes it better. Yeah, then shivers down your spine. But it's, just, I mean, it fits that. Yeah, it's not like, a, you know, they would suddenly do a slash. But the thing is, is I would take that guitar solo... People might think I'm nuts over a slash. I mean, 
Not necessarily because if you're, yeah, that's a completely different genre. But like, I, I would take that personally. It just because it just goosebumps. Like, you know, I feel everything so intensely anyway. And that's just that kind of music. I'm just like, yeah, my hairs stand on end. I'm just like, oh, I could explode. Yeah, basically. I mean, there's a time and place for everything. But uh, yeah. Liv, last question for you, uh, Mount Rushmore. Who is the four bands? Or, or artists for yourself at the top of the pile for you? Well, it, okay. Uh, it's difficult because I have so many. I had, My playlist is... Could, do I have to, does it have to be a band? I would say Hans Zimmer as, an, as a, you know, one of the living, best living composers of all time. Um, Muse, Pink Floyd, and then the fourth one would be... Hold, to be honest, just because of only for like my love of hers. I basically she's my idol in terms of singing and style. I would love her confidence and everything. So yeah, I guess I would pick those four. What about you? For me, uh, it does obviously like yourself. It would, you know, if you ask me tomorrow, it might be different. Yeah, but I can only think on bands that you know that I've I've found something from them. So the Doors would be one of them. Metallica's got to be one. I'm still listening to them after 30 years. Probably yeah. Iron Maiden's another one. Mm. But then on Shout the, out to Dave. Sorry, my friend's on tour with him right now. Yeah. And then on the, on the complete flip side to that, there's there's a an English, he was a folk singer. Well, it was classed as folk music called Nick Drake. I don't know if you've heard of him. Mm-hmm. I'm bad with names. He was... Um, he was around in the 70s and unfortunately he he committed suicide but he, he never performed live he recorded three albums and uh, and then he just he just wasn't in a good frame of mind but he song over the years that became sort of cult classics and uh, his songwriting is is outstanding his lyrics he, and a lot of it's just him on the guitar playing the guitar and singing there's not much else maybe a wee bit of piano mm. but it's one of those ones, if you pop it in in the car when you're driving somewhere, it's just, it sounds absolutely outstanding. And it's just yeah. a that somebody like that, he didn't see how good he was back then. You know, nowadays mm. we managed to get help or that, but, you know, if you ask me tomorrow, I'll probably give you four other bands. <laughs> well, yeah, same. I'm thinking I've forgotten every single artist in the entire world. Like, people like wolf alice the song silk and stuff like that two feet is amazing like these are all mod like ones i listen to on repeat like nowadays and stuff like that but but yeah like if you were going to say top four of all time then i'd have to pick the classic greats so Liv, thank you so much for coming on it's been a pleasure to you. and to pick your brain about all things music uh, before we go what have you got planned for the rest of the year yeah, thank you for having me. You're awesome. Very, very good questions. Um, I the rest of the year, so America. Basically, I'm in New New York State right now. Um, I can't say much about that, but yeah, just work, working on lots of things and uh, doing lots of music. I guess now I have the new manager. Well, so we we downstairs. Chris is the director of Festival Works, and he's a drummer. We're putting a band together here, and then. Um, writing, recording, lots of more music, doing shows outside of America. Um, and, uh, yeah, just tons, tons of stuff going on, really. Um, but I can't – I will – I'll be able to announce that later on. Can't reveal too much just now. But if anybody's interested, you're on social media. They can look you up, give you a follow, and uh, and all will be revealed in time. <laughs> yeah, sorry. That sounds so, like, ridiculous. But my next song out is Poison, and I'm doing uh, – I'm, I'm having a meeting with uh, some people, really, really cool people who did Marvel movies and stuff like that with that, so that's exciting. And I did that with Andres Almeida from Narcos, who is um, – Cochi Loco in, in the show. He's amazing. Musician and actor. So, and yeah. at Le- Live Adair Music Instagram. Cool. Liv, wish you all the, the luck in the future and uh, keep in touch. Thanks so much for having me. Lovely to meet you. And I, I wish you the best. <laughs>